Good deal. All right, let's join me in prayer, please. Father God, um, thank you again that uh, uh, this church right here, this church that meets on Wednesday nights online uh, is gathered again in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, to worship you and to uh, praise you and to learn from you. And so Jesus, would you reveal uh, things we need to reveal your character to us. I just am always reminded that who, who would be better to teach us about the character of Jesus than Jesus. And so um, reveal yourself to us tonight uh, through the words that are said and through the, the word that we read together. Um, you, you promise, you tell us that the, the words of God never go out void and we are depending on you for that and we ask you to let it bear much fruit in our lives this evening. Thank you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Good, good. All right, y'all. Man, we're, we're into an appropriate topic here tonight, probably, for some of us. Many of us. We're in chapter 6. And we're picking up verse 25. And, uh, and Jesus is going to start entering a little you know, a little bit into some very, I mean, it's all been practical, okay, but here is a another, we, we talked about, uh, you know, laying up treasure in the right places, we talked about, you know, making sure our focus is on the kingdom of God, um, and that we're faith-based people, and now Jesus is going to talk about a, a practical working out of our, our faith, and he's going to do it by comparing faith and anxiety. So let's, let's pick up together in verse 25 of chapter six. And Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are they not much more valuable are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying at a single hour to your life? Okay, we'll just keep on going. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or where, what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. <laughs> okay. Any big picture first impressions to this section of verses? No, we don't worry about anything. <laughs> the the crowd that he was speaking to. Yeah. Um, what was there? I, I looked at a few commentaries and I really couldn't put put an answer to this. Yeah. Um, what 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 was he trying to speak to to them what was their source of anxiousness of fear of of worry that he was trying to 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 deal with it probably wasn't covid-19 like it is for us but what what was causing him to speak this way to them what was he trying to address do you know uh, well not specifically you know we we get the context of of even going back to, you know, his model prayer of give us this day our daily bread. Uh, again, a communal prayer, a corporate prayer, but it talks about this, this daily dependency. And, and he just finished a section talking about possessions, don't let possessions rule you. Uh, and so, you know, I think a, you know, that generic Jewish crowd from around that area that's gathered is probably could be easily concerned about, well, 
am I going to have enough to eat? Am I going to have adequate clothing? Um, I can see where that would, you know, they're not worried about COVID. They, they, even in this moment, I'm not even sure he's telling them, you know, you know, I know your concerns about the Romans, you know, occupying your country. I think he's becoming really, really practical. He's talking about a practical working out of your faith about, you know, how do you view each day? Maybe. I think that's um, no matter what generation or time history in history or whatever, um, we worry. Yeah. Worry about tomorrow. Worry uh, about our children. How they're gonna do? Uh, I, I mean, I guess it's a natural, natural, a human, natural, you know, thing in us. Yeah. The uncertainty of things of what's gonna happen. Mm. It's sort of um, well, whether it's the Jewish audience. 2000 years ago or the audience today, it's somewhat the same in the sense that he's saying, uh, you know, sort of saying, don't worry about hustling about to clothe yourself and feed yourself and get all caught up in the hustling about, but consider yourself as a spiritual being and a part of God's kingdom. You know, it's, it's, uh, just don't lose sight of that because you're chasing after food or, or drink or whatever, or clothing or whatever. Your daily needs. There's yeah. more than just your daily needs here. Yeah, I can, I can see. You know, where having just talked about, you know, you know, don't accumulate a whole bunch of things. Don't let the accumulation of things become your focus. You know. And I can imagine the crowd going, I, oh, thanks for that, Jesus. Uh, if we ever win the lottery, you know, we'll, we'll remember that. Okay. Um, you know, but I think he even brings it down a, a level that says, and for those who, who view who, you know, possessions and accumulating the things is not a big issue. Let, let me talk about day to day existence where you wonder and you worry sometimes um, about. Uh, about that. Martha, Mary and Martha, uh, remember, Martha was the worrier, wasn't she? Mm -hmm. Okay. Martha, Martha, you are worried about many, many things. Okay. But Mary has chosen the better. So was Martha, should she have just been cast all, all prudence to the wind and, and just is that what Jesus is calling us to do? What's the relationship between being prudent and being anxious? That's a really good question. I'm okay. looking forward to hearing the answer. No, you've got it, John. Go ahead. Speak it, man. No, 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 no. I'm in listening mode right now. <laughs> do you think Jesus? Okay, okay. Let's take it to an extreme, maybe. Don't worry about food. Don't worry about drink. Don't worry about clothes. God knows. Seek the kingdom. He'll provide. Therefore, I'm not going to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> I don't need to. Because the only reason I work is so I can get food and drink and, and buy clothes. And, and Jesus said, don't worry about that stuff. God's going to provide. No, I think he's saying, I don't think that's it. I think he's saying that that's not all there is. Okay. God helps those who help themselves. Chapter and verse. <laughs> don't ask me, but I, I just, <laughs> but I mean, he doesn't expect us to just sit back and expect him to take care of us. Oh, it's a Chinese proverb. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. What? Yeah. You know, I, and, 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 and is a component of this, yeah. uh, you touched on it. Uh, God's going to feed me. God's going to pay my mortgage. God's going to pay the car insurance. So I don't have to go to work today. Yep. And I can just sit back and do nothing and not have a care in the world. And Amazon's going to deliver all of the stuff from God that I need to take care of day-to-day -day life. Or 
is it that what God provided you a job? He provided you the intellect and the ability to work. He provided you all of the things necessary to earn a living. So why, why are you so concerned about what he has already given you? Um, is there a component of that in it as well? Well, you know, in a sense, we were just doing the purpose-driven life last night. And one of the things that came up is that work can be a form of worship. The only difference yeah. is attitude. What's yeah. your attitude? So if you, I mean, I've loved my work and, and, you know, it's God gave me the skills to do the things I've done. And so in a sense, I'm worshiping him when I do my work and enjoy my work. Yeah. Yeah. Those are great applications for the Western world. How does it apply to areas of the world where there isn't work or there isn't food? There isn't enough. Good question. which may have been more the context of the people that are sitting at Jesus' feet. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, well, I think... or even today, in, I mean, even in our part of the world, in the Western world, uh, many of us, well, we retire, but uh, for a lot of people, they can find work. And, and, but sometimes there are situations that people can't find work for whatever reason maybe the skills or maybe they're overqualified or and they have children and how am i going to provide uh so you know yeah and circumstances and but does it come down to he got it sounds really bad but is he is he more concerned about your spiritual well-being than your physical well-being? Is he more concerned about eternity than I don't know. you know? So I think he's I think he's looking at it at a much loftier level than we do. Um, we look at at it from a very physical viewpoint, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if he's speaking from a more spiritual, maybe. Um, you know, I think of, I think of um, scripture, you know, the scripture where, you know, all, where, you know, um, I know which one you're talking about. I mean, well, where your needs will all be met and so forth. But what is your need? Your need is for Christ. Um, your need is to have a relationship with God. That's your greatest need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everything else is secondary. That I, I love that need. Uh, it, Yes. What is my uh, what is my greatest need? My greatest need is that relationship with Jesus. Okay. But even in the realm of the pra of the the possessions, the material things of life, uh, you know, what I need versus what I want, it hasn't mm -hmm. hasn't that been in the in our Western world mentality, hasn't that been one of our greatest frustrations? You know. Uh, God, God, I need a new car. Well, no, my car still runs. It's just, I want a new car. You know, well, God will provide for all your needs according to his riches and glory. There, there's a scripture we love. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, does that mean I get my new car next week? <laughs> no, he's provided for my need. <laughs> uh, it, and so we in the Western world, I know, you know, those of you who have gone on mission trips, uh, you know, you've seen a whole different perspective where, where, uh, you know, the things we, they could never envision the things we want because they're still looking for the things they need, but they're grateful when they get them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think Jesus, you know, is encouraging us. To, to be prudent, you know, don't be stupid. He, in a number of other places, he talks about how, how the, the unbelievers are better businessmen than the believers are, you know, sometimes. Um, but to, so to be prudent, but not to be 
anxious. Wor worry is that that over concern and that undue worry that comes as a result of living without faith in him. Boy, one one commentator phew, was just brutal and said, if you are continuously anxious, you do not believe. Wow. I don't know, but if you're anxious, what are you where is your focus? Yeah. I mean, your focus then is not on, on God. It's not on doing what he's asking you to do. It's not on communicating with him. It's on that, that thing you're worried about. True. But for the, for the people Jesus is talking to, I think you were right, Debbie. Some of them are living hand to mouth. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a, that's a, that's tough to pardon the, pardon the reference, tough to swallow for somebody who hasn't eaten for three days. Mm -hmm. um, but the scripture yeah. also says who can add a day to their life you know mm -hmm. by worrying about it if anything you're going to subtract a few true that's probably right that's true uh, we need to trust the Lord we, we do and, and many times we're just anxious about things that we can do nothing about it anyway right and um so, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, why worry that much? Yeah. It's, it's interesting that Jesus, at, at the end of this portion, he gives, uh, he gives a possible way to defeat worry. He says, concentrate on the kingdom of God, and you won't have time to be worried. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, well, and, you know, that's, Okay, everyone that's on the screen, you know, for, for the next four minutes, do not think about pink elephants. Okay, okay. And so how do we how do we approach that challenge? Very often it's won't think about pink elephants, won't think about pink elephants, don't think about pink elephants, which means you're fixated on pink elephants. Yeah. You know, what's the best way to not think about a pink elephant for four minutes? Replace it with something else. I was yep. going to say, think about a blue elephant. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> success, victory. Oh, Vicky, you got all the answers. <laughs> no, I don't have any answers. But, but you know, kind of tongue in cheek, you know. But I, I, I think Jesus is saying sometimes you people can get twisted around the axle, thinking about pink elephants, worried about where they're going to come from, or how are you going to find another one, and you know. And he says, if you'll just think about blue elephant. <laughs> Yeah, if you just think about the kingdom, you'll, your faith will increase. If you just think about the kingdom, you'll be so busy focusing on God things that you won't have nearly as enough as much time to worry about things. I don't think God is. I don't think Jesus is calling us to be careless, but carefree. You know, it's it, you, you were mentioning about missions, and it just popped into my mind that, you know, when we were in Nicaragua, and they would have uh, church service on Wednesday night, there would be so many people. Now, these are very, very poor people. Yeah. Very, very poor people. And they would show up, and they would have their best clothing on, and they would fill that church up. I mean, there would be people leaning in the windows to hear what the pastor had to say, right? These are very poor people, but they had an emphasis on the spiritual world, on God, on Christ, yeah. that I don't see a lot of times you know. here. Yeah. yeah. So whether you've got it or you don't have it, um, I mean, that to me makes sense with what Christ is saying here. You know, the... The birds are fed, you know, the, the flowers are beautiful. You know, he's, he's saying it will, t we'll take care of that, you know? Yeah. And I know yeah. that's easy to say when you've got a lot. Yeah. These people didn't have anything. Yeah. I mean, nothing. Not, yeah. And I'm not sure he's saying he's going to give them everything or what, everything they need, ev everything they want. No, I don't think he is either. But what there's, there's no, believers who don't have enough food, who go without, who... You say focus Ooh. on the kingdom. Yeah. And, and rejoice, saying. like like Paul was telling to the Philippians in in that uh, four, chapter four, 
Um, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. But we concentrate, like David was saying, we concentrate on God. We bring our petitions to Him, and He will give us peace in whatever situation we may be. Mm -hmm. I mean, may not be about food, may be no, about it's... our children, that no, or it's peace. whatever, you know. Yeah, it's peace. It's not food. Exactly. Yeah, it's grace. Yeah. I think I think sometimes we, uh, as Western Americans, I as a Western American, uh, one of the things that may hinder the the growth or expansiveness of, of my faith is that I have too much. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I'm thinking about uh, a book that I have on my shelf. Uh, you know, simple trust, simple prayers, the story of George Mueller. Mm. Okay, you some of you recognize that name. George Mueller uh, is famous for the orphanage that he ran yeah. uh, for decades. And it was not uncommon for the orphans to be literally sitting at the tables in in the dining room with no food in the kitchen and george Mueller was not a man who worried he, he was not continuously anxious he just prayed and the milkman would pull up alongside with his cart and say uh overestimated deliveries you know got this extra milk you know and the the farmer coming back from market says i i thought i could sell all my chickens but i couldn't here's some chickens and George Mueller's recounting of, of years and years of just enough, just in time, but he wasn't worried because he just says, I know God's going to provide. Man, I got to be careful how I say this. Wow, I wish I had faith like George Mueller. Yeah. And I could hear God going, yeah. really? Well, then stand by. We can grow that <laughs> faith for you by taking a whole lot of things away from you. Not to punish you, but to answer your prayer. <laughs> uh, okay, because it's just silly for someone who has, and I do it, I do it. This is, it's silly for someone who has as much as I have, both materially, relationally. It, it, it's silly for me to worry, but I do. And that's my lack of faith. And I suppose my faith could be grown if I had to be George Mueller. Okay. Any other thoughts? She get the name. <clears throat> simple prayer, simple. Yeah, I read an article that I want to share with you. Good. It says worry is inconsistent. If we can trust God to provide us with our life, can we not also trust him with our daily needs? Worry is irrational. If the Lord cares for the birds, then why wouldn't he care for us? Are we not more valuable than the birds? Worry is ineffective. Who can add one cubit to our stature? <coughs> worry is illogical. If God can clothe the lilies of the field, can he not also clothe us? Worry mm -hmm. is irreligious. When we worry, we act like those who don't know God. Good. No. That's what really grabbed me the last one. When we worry, we act like we don't trust God to provide for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jim? Sir? Is there a tipping point between being prudent and diligent with our resources and worry? I'm aware that if I leave my house unlocked, somebody might come in in the middle of the night yeah but i don't really worry about it um is is there is there is there a break point where awareness and concern may be too strong of a word uh, but diligence in our actions turns over to worry how can we tell when we've gone from once up from being aware to letting worry consume us i guess is my question i can answer that 
from the standpoint myself of materialism when I have finances and money on my mind more often than I have God on my mind, okay? And I have done that, okay? I'm down the wrong path. Mm. That, for me, it's not that complicated for me. That's my big, my big process is, is it's not about money. It's about how you view it, how you think of it, how you use it. It's not what you've got. It's how you use it. And, and the, the prudent thing, let's go back to Martha for just a moment. Jesus uh, had, had visited the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, but Mary and Martha many, many times. And I could just imagine that of many, many of those other times, he was very thankful for Martha's diligence uh, in the kitchen and for the joy they had around the table because she, you know, kept a good house, kept a good kitchen. That was prudent. But something changed in that last visit that Mary apparently could sense that this was probably the last time they're going to see Jesus. It's more important to sit at his feet and listen now than it is to make dinner. And Martha missed that. And so I think, you know, I, I don't think that Jesus was saying to Martha, you know, working in the kitchen right now is a bad thing, Martha. You know, don't ever do that again. I think he was saying, you know, you're not sensitive to the fact, to the reality that there is a more important thing happening right now. Mm. And I think, like Hal talked about, if I get, if I get worried about my business, and I, to the deficit of the more important thing, which is Jesus and the kingdom, then Jesus would say to me, Jim, Jim, Hal, Hal, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but you're missing the best. Yeah. All right. Yep. Cool. All right. Let's jump right on. Woohoo! Verse seven and a few others. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye? When all the time there's a plank in your own eye, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Woo! Such simple words. So much controversy. <laughs> Boy, this, this goes all over the place sometimes. Yep. Yep. The Bible the, let's lay just a little bit of foundation. The, the Bible records so much about of what God thinks about what humans are doing. It, it just from the Ten Commandments to Jesus' words, it records a, so much of what God thinks about what humans are doing. And, you know, as we read God's word, it becomes very challenging for us not to assume and put on the the mantle of the bible's recorded perspective again that perspective that's revealed in the word is god's perspective it's not our perspective it's god's perspective it's god's perspective on us not our perspective on others and that's where we tend to slide back into i have read the word of god i have I've got it here. I've memorized it. And now I will assume the role of the one who wrote it. Mm -hmm. The Pharisee. Yeah. <clears throat> and Jesus says, no bueno. Mm -hmm. James, brother of Jesus, if you were with us in the James study, back in chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, he, he warns us that, that we, when we begin to judge or condemn others, we are assuming the posture of God, not the posture of humans. We're usurping the role of God. And yes, 
we may know what God thinks from what he has revealed in the word, but we still are not God. <laughs> Instead, we need to hear from God and to be responsive to and responsible for that perspective in the word, in the world. So we need to distinguish between moral discernment and personal condemnation. The ability to discern good from bad versus the posture of condemning people. The word judge here, judge not, that Jesus used is, is a word in the Greek, krino, transliterated K-R-I-N-O. And it's really expansive. It's really big. It covers everything from moral discernment to the final damnation of God. Uh, so we get the whole span. So perhaps it could be simplified to this. Jesus might be telling us that we are to conclude that that is wrong, because I've looked at God's perspective, and he says that is wrong, or that is good, because God has relayed through people who've written the scripture, that is good, but we must never pronounce you are condemned by God. Because the be perhaps the best translation of judge not to be not judged in this context might be, do not condemn, or you too will be condemned by God. Hmm, thought so far. All right, I'll keep pulling it out of you. Jesus is not offering society a blanket tolerance or a call to moral indifference. He's just talking about our horrible tendency to judge. And, you know, we can examine actions and attitudes because they're very external, but we can never see another person's motives. We can only observe from without. We only know a fraction of what is really going on inside a person. So we never really know all the facts or the whole person. Billy Sunday was a um, well-known preacher back years ago, and he had a quote about this. He says, criticizing others requires no brains or sense or thought, very little reading, and less yet of observation. He just says, it's so easy to judge people. <laughs> and this one, this observation, uh, it is generally true that the things we criticize in others, we are guilty of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Boy, that is, a, that is a real tendency among us pastor preacher people. We tend to preach most about that with which we struggle most. Mm -hmm. you know, I can remember many, many, many years ago, sitting underneath the teaching of a, of a pastor who was who was hell on alcohol. Oh my goodness, death on it. Well, he had been hit by a drunk driver and had rolled his car multiple times and he almost died. So yeah, you know, I'm, so usually it's the things that I can, I can most see in you what I struggle with in me can tend to be true. Uh, a critical spirit reveals that there's something wrong with me and that evil within makes it actually makes me actually incapable of being fair. And then he moves on to that whole discussion about specs and logs. Tell me about that. You know, I've always heard it say that um, we judge others by their actions and we judge ourselves by our intentions. Uh -huh. And it's much easier to have good intentions yeah. than to have good actions. Mm -hmm. Jesus is concerned about specks and logs for a number of reasons. Let's see if we can pull someone out, some of them out of there. What's one reason Jesus is concerned about specks and logs? There's a hint in your question, but I'm not discerning it. Okay. Well, there's an element of um, inequality there where, okay. it's, you know, it's not... It's like we're, we'll pick on the little thing, even though we're dealing with the big thing. Mm -hmm. 
we'll forgive the big thing in us, but we won't forget the forgive the little thing in someone else. Okay. Other things. Well, it's pretty hard to see. It's pretty. It's sometimes hard to. I don't know whether judge is the right word, but to be introspective to understand where you make your mistakes. Uh huh. Sometimes you don't realize just a simple word that was didn't mean anything to you really harmed somebody else, but you didn't know that. So you you know you you don't. Uh, I guess you just don't judge your, uh, I'll speak for myself. Yeah. I don't judge myself um, as well as I judge others or as often as I judge others. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Another way of saying that is I am not very prone to quality self-examination. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm getting better, but I, yeah. no, I'm yeah. not. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and, and Jesus is saying, is there a speck in your brother's eye? Yes, there yeah, is. I can see that. Yeah. yeah and it, <laughs> and it probably, it probably hurts and, and you're concerned and you want to remove it. Uh, that's an observation of another person. Good for you. However, you have not done any kind of self-examination. You, you have not come to grips with your own evil judgmental self. And, and it's, you know, in a comical way, Jesus says, that's like having a log or a plank or two by four in your eye. And so one reason he wants us, you know, to be aware of specks and planks is, hey, you know, you're not doing a very honest job of self-examination. You're not owning who you really are, and you need to quit evading that and start looking not not perpetually introspective and self condemning but but just honest and real you know when when paul calls us before communion of the lord's supper to examine ourselves yeah that that's a part of this you know don't be looking at the people around you this is they're with you at the table but this is between you and jesus and so okay here's another thing do you think Jesus is concerned about the speck in that other person's eye? Yes. I do. Yes. Probably, Why? yes. And I think he's telling us, I want that speck to be removed from that person's eye, but you're incapable of doing it. That's because of exactly the right. Please. Please remove the log, not only for your own self sake, but so that you can actually be beneficial to someone else. Debbie? It's, well, I feel like this just actually flows from the last passages that we read about worry. Okay. It, it sounds like he's really more concerned about where our head is and what we're consumed with and what we're thinking about. And he wants us to have our head in the right place, be thinking of the right things and not get distracted by yeah. our worries, get distract, distracted by other people. Um, it's, it's a head thing. It's what, what's going on in your head? Where yeah. is your head? Yeah, yeah. Very good. To, when, back in the day when I was able to meet with the young high school men that I was uh, working with and walking through life with. Two of the things that we continually tried to learn together was how important it is to understand your own reflection in the mirror, to do a true and honest self-evaluation of yourself. And, and, and the second thing was when you get to the point where you can lie to yourself you are in real danger and trouble. Um, you might be able to tell the entire world a story, um, but when you can lie to yourself and you believe the lie, mm -hmm. then you, have, you are at great, great, great risk. I was never encouraging them to lie to anyone, including themselves or others, um, but just cautioning them when they would yeah. 
when when we believe the lie, uh, we have, uh, we have multiple problems. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Self delusion is a common disease. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When, you know, when we don't judge ourselves, when we don't self examine, we, we don't, when we don't deal with the plank in our own eye, well, it hurts us because I've still got a big plank in my eye. But it also hurts all those to whom we could have ministered, but can't or don't. Yeah. Um, some general observations about judgment. Uh, Christians tend to be harder on fellow Christians than on others. Yeah. Okay, here's another one. We, we can also tend to major on the minors and minimize the majors. That's judgment. Christians seem to eat their own. <laughs> yeah. Huh? Yeah. I mean, it's a it's a sad truth. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is. But with within the church, sometimes we are the most critical, judgmental, irritating people. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. And and. And we should be just the opposite. And, and finally, you know, there is a sad reputation in general of Christians in the world that says Christians are judgmental. And we are. Isn't that sad? Yeah. yeah. I remember one of, I remember a moment on one of my trips to Israel. There was a gentleman on the trip who I'd never met before. And he was telling us a story about a pastor at his church. And he was one of the pastors at the church. And the pastor, the pastor messed up. Yeah. Pastor messed up. And he got called before the elders and he got called before all of the other pastors. And the general consensus was to eat our own. We must dismiss him uh, for the good of, for whatever reason. You've got to go. You're done. You messed up. You're done. And and they invited uh, his his wife into the conversation, and she looked at him and simply said, "Please just come home and learn how to be my husband again." And one of the senior elders uh, looked at him and 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 looked at the other elders. And, and said, we are being a little bit rash here. Um, and he looked at, the, looked at the young man and he said, here's what we're going to do. I can't travel. I can't go out. So you're going to be at my house every morning at 430. And we are going to dig into God's word and we are going to pray and we are going to walk a path together until your passion for God and God being the central focus of your life is restored mm -hmm. um and and like you said sometimes we eat the others i think that that se seasoned gentleman did not have a plank in his eye he saw the speck in his brother's eye and said here i'm going to walk with you on a path towards your restoration with god yeah. mm. Good. god that jesus didn't take the approach that we eat our own that you know, he forgave all the specks and planks yeah. and accepted us the way we were. Yeah. Um, as Christians, I believe we do have to talk to one another when we see someone that is doing something totally wrong that they need, that maybe they're not even aware of what, you know, of what their lifestyle or what they've just said looks like to everybody. Um, I think we do need to talk with one another, but like John said, we can't bite each other's heads off. Yeah. 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 Sometimes, you know, we, we revel in the truth and that's as far as we go, but we should have equal amounts of truth and grace. And if we can't do that, we shouldn't be dispensing truth. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I, I, I know Don loves to, you know, to just kind of generalize this, this that says love, 
trumps truth. Now, that doesn't mean truth isn't important, you know, but but Jesus's message was love as you've been loved. And, and sometimes we can go back here to where, but I know, I know, and Jesus, and if this is is going to, if, if you're trying to take a speck out of somebody else's eye while there's the judgmental plank in yours, that love has to trump it. You got it, got to overcome that. And that's what that, that's what that pastor did, John. He, he let love trump what needed to be done there. Good, good, good. Mm -hmm. Let me squeeze one more verse out of you tonight, just because this is kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. And you're going, what is that all about? Yeah, I've and, never thought this. Yeah, and it, it, interestingly, it, it, it really is probably a detached standalone statement. We, we see it kind of connected to the judge not to be not judged, but it, it, in the Greek context, it probably stands alone. And it is a, are you ready for this? It is a, it's a chiasm. It's a chiasm where you have something presented, something different presented, the second thing presented again, and then the first thing presented again. So in this case, the chiasm is A, do not give dogs what is sacred. The B is do not throw your pearls to pigs. Still related to pigs is, you know, if you do, they will blah, 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 just a minute. If you do, they will tramp them underneath their feet and then back to the dogs and they will tear, they will turn and tear you into pieces. Okay, so it, when read that way, it makes a little more sense because that is a, a very typical uh, way of doing things in the scripture. And so you get the ABBA. -A. So dogs, pigs, pigs, dogs. Okay, so don't give to dogs what is sacred or they will turn and tear you to pieces. Do not throw your pearls to pigs because if you do, they may trample them under their feet. My, my translation is different. Okay. I have the NLT and it says, don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Mm. That's what I have too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I want you to see the, 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 the not unusual structure. And, and then Jesus, you know, he, he's choosing dogs and pigs. <laughs> you know, he's choosing the most despised among animals as a label for those who despise the kingdom. And, and so the traditional understanding here of the, of the word sacred that Debbie's reading or holy is the gospel. It's like Jesus saying, don't waste time and energy sharing the gospel with those who will not listen. Okay, that's a broad base. In the moment, it gets a little more refined. Dogs and pigs were terms that were widely used by the Jews to speak of the Gentiles. And perhaps Jesus is simply saying, don't take the gospel and the kingdom vision to the Gentiles until after the resurrection and the Pentecost and and Pentecost. If you take it now, it'll be like casting pearls before pigs. Mm. Jesus saying we got to hold the gospel as utterly, utterly sacred in how we handle it. Wow. Okay. All right, team. Next week, Debbie and I are going to be in Charlotte visiting our son, Mike, and see his new apartment and and him and uh, uh, someone else, perhaps John, perhaps Don, Don. John's good. Okay. John will be facilitating next Wednesday. Yeah. And and one more thing. Next, next Wednesday is the 18th. 
And uh, the next Wednesday thereafter is the night before Thanksgiving, and then we enter into December. So the original plan is, if you might have seen it when I first put it out, was to do this study up up until November the 18th. And then we're, we're going to be done, at least for the holiday season, but pray, may, may, but. So John's going to do the wrap-up. He's finishing the entire Chapter 7 next week. You don't want to miss it. <laughs> But thank you. Wear your running shoes, okay? Yeah. Oh my goodness! Yeah, see, there's a whole bunch of good stuff, it. isn't there, in there, Vicky? Oh, we'll get through it. We'll. I have full confidence in John. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to talk about prosperity theology, the golden rule. Oh my goodness! And a tree and its fruit. Oh, and then I never knew you. Yeah. <sighs> Uh, that could be great. And John will be developing specific formulas for you to work oh, on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. There'll be yeah. handouts and everything. It's going to be great. Yeah. Okay, They'll so. have it all laid out in differential equations. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so, so good. So, so good. Well, uh, thank you. Appreciate you all. Appreciate you sharing, you know, again, the time uh, with us and with me and, uh, and, uh, Maybe someone would pray for us as we the as we close out this evening. Have and, a very safe trip. Well, thank you, ma'am. We'll yes. see you next week. Exactly. And and who will take responsibility to remind me to record. Record. hit the to record. record button? Aha. Aha. I will remember. We'll all remind you. Yeah. yeah. We will. That's Jim, what I'd, we like. There you Good go. Job. Jim, I'd love to pray us out. Thank you, sir. Father. You've given us so much this evening. You've given us an incredible gift. You've given us a time, uh, a, the gift of time, of communication, of examination of your word, of learning. Father, I pray that each and every one of us and everyone who might stream or see this moment in the future would, would plant this in their heart and then put it into action, Father. Yeah. Father, let this... Let what we have learned tonight impact how we approach every tomorrow. Yeah. Father, for myself, I would ask that you continually guide me to self-examination, uh, to being honest with myself so that I can help others. Father, I don't know what, uh, what the others will gather from tonight, but I pray for each and every one of them to take whatever message you had for them and then to put it into practice. I thank you for all of the souls that are seeing this and participating. It's in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. 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 All right, y'all. Thank, thank you. you. Right. Good, good to see you. Have a great Bye -bye. evening. Bye. 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 Night, Peggy. <laughs>